<laughs> okay, so I'm going to talk today about a project um, that John Navazio and I have been working on in terms of selecting organic fresh market tomatoes for the Midwest U.S. And I guess give you a little bit of an introduction to the Midwest U.S., um, what our systems are like there, and explain why we chose to start working with tomatoes for this project. I'm going to discuss some germplasm screening trials we did in 2011 and 2012, and then talk about some of our ongoing selection efforts, which started last summer in 2013. So if any of you aren't familiar with the Midwest or where Purdue University is, um, I guess let's see here, my, my little cursor. We're right here in northern Indiana, just south of Lake Michigan. Um, this is in an, in an area, a very productive farmland. It's prime farmland, has really beautiful soils. Um, it's also in a region um, commonly called the Corn Belt. So it's dominated right now by maize and soybean production. Um, but like most areas around the country, local food movement is growing really rapidly. Um, this figure just shows the farmer's markets in 2011. So you can see we're in an area that's just surrounded by people who are interested in um, local sources of food and specialty crops. Um, so there's a lot of potential for growth in this region. And um, one of the objectives of this project was we wanted to find something that we could work on that would be of value to growers, so developing a new crop but also a project that we could use as an educational tool to help teach people about seed saving and participatory breeding and how that would work. So the reason we chose tomatoes was one, because they tend to be one of the most profitable direct market crops. So most of our small scale um, growers that are marketing to CSAs or farmers markets are growing tomatoes. Um, it's a crop that's rapidly growing in organic production. It's been growing annually for about 16%. Um, certified acres in 2011 were 9,200. It grows really well in the Midwest. We're proud to say in Indiana that we're second in processing tomatoes in the country, which is pretty far behind California, but um, they grow pretty well there. And this also serves as an ideal model crop for participatory plant breeding because it is primarily self-pollinated, has, you know, relatively simple genetics. So it's something that we could, felt we could actually work with. And for someone like myself who does not have training in plant breeding. So one of the first things we did was to do a grower survey. Um, this was with a group I'll talk about. We wanted to understand what were the factors constraining organic production in the Midwest. Um, we wanted to know with tomato, what are the major pests that growers are having a problem with, what are some of the traits they'd like to see in a tomato breeding program, and then we wanted to know a little bit about how organic and conventional growers differed in their pests and desirable um, breeding traits to, you know, look at do we need a separate breeding program or things like that. Um, so this is a, a couple tables from our survey results. You can see here on this table, let's see, we had this is Midwest growers. We had 154 organic farmers and 135 conventional farmers that filled out our online survey. And these are some of this, the, the main traits that came out. Um, the ones that are in yellow are ones that are statistic, statistically different between organic and conventional growers. So both groups overwhelmingly wanted flavor as a breeding trait, but organic growers um, tend to prefer that more than conventional growers. Um, See, disease, crack resistance, and color and shape were also high um, among, or well, the disease and crack resistance were relatively high, but conventional growers were much more concerned about disease resistance, crack res resistance, and that color and shape. Um, nutritional quality, organic growers were overwhelmingly more interested in that at 27%. Um, Neither were that concerned about weed competitiveness, and surprisingly, nutrient use efficiency wasn't a top concern, but organic growers were more concerned um, than conventional growers. In terms of our pests, um, hopefully you can read this, the, the organic and conventional growers ranked um, pretty similarly about the major pests, so early blight and late blight were big, along with septoria and bacterial spot and speck. But interestingly, from the ones highlighted in yellow are the statistically significant differences. 
And in all of these cases, the conventional growers were much more concerned about these things being a pest than organic growers, which was really very interesting. Um, but on the flip side, organic growers, this column here looks at how difficult they find that to control and white mold and root knot nematodes organic growers are more concerned about. So that's something we can um, target in the future. So our next um, step in this process was to identify germplasm. And so one of the things we did was talk to tomato breeders all across the country to ask them about, um, you know, germplasm or characteristics they thought might be good for us in the Midwest. Um, we also talked to a number of local growers. These are two of my favorites. This is Valentino. He moved from Italy to Indiana to be able to fulfill his lifelong dream of farming. Um, and this is Nathan, who um, was actually raised on a corn farm in the Midwest, never thought he could start farming until he learned about CSAs and was able to start a small market farm there. So they gave us a lot of advice about um, different heirlooms, varieties, and hybrids that they like to use. And then we worked with a local organic seed company, Nature's Crossroads, to find some locally developed heirlooms and source seeds, um, if we could, from the varieties we were interested in. So step three was the screening program that we did um, in 2011 and 12. We had 32 varieties, um, six plants per plot, and four replicates per entry. And we looked at um, performance, so we looked at vigor, how early vigor, we had a rating system there. Um, we looked at disease incidence. Um, we looked at insect damage, which I'll talk about, um, maturity and yield. As soon as the varieties started putting on fruit, we went out weekly and looked at marketable fruit, unmarketable fruit, and then um, flavor, which we did more internally with the lab. So for some of the results, the most prominent pathogens that we saw each year were early blight and bacterial spec. We really didn't see a lot of septoria. And in 2011 and 12, we did not see any late blight, which hasn't in the past been very prominent in our region. So that wasn't um, really that surprising. In 2011, disease incidence was much greater than 2012. 2012 was a very hot, um, dry year. Um, this table here is just a subsection of the results. This is the area under the disease progress curve. And you can see these are the ones up here in pink are the ones that had the most um, disease incidence. And luckily, silvery fir tree, which was our Czech variety, um, had lots of disease each year. And down here, these are the ones with the lowest in yellow. Uh, Mountain Magic is a variety, a hybrid out of uh, the North Carolina program. It's a very robust hybrid, has really good early blight and late blight resistance. So it performed relatively well. But what was interesting is these segregating populations down here um, that start with OSA that came from um, some crosses that John made actually did really well and even did better than um, the Mountain Magic. And so there was substantial variation. See, so insects. Does anybody recognize what this insect is? <laughs> yeah. So this is hornworm. Um, it's not something that's generally considered a, a really problematic pest because you can grab it and you can pull it off the tomato and swish it. I don't really like doing that very much. Um, I don't know about you. But what was interesting is that one of my colleagues, um, who's an entomologist, we were walking through the plots and he's like, gosh, you know, it really looks like there's some variation um, in this insect resistance. So he went out and did some careful collection uh, through the plots. And sure enough, we did have extreme varietal differences in how susceptible the plants were to hornworm resistant or to hornworm with some having very high incidence and some including this OSA 823 having um, being very resistant to um, the hornworm. So the entomologist is following that up with some lab studies of, you know, does the mother preferentially not lay on these varieties or does, do they lay on varieties indiscriminately, but the babies just don't survive on those varieties for some reason. In terms of yield, um, there's huge variation among the varieties, of course, um, in yield and in marketable fruit. Um, in 2012, we had a lot less marketable fruit because of this, um, incident here. I don't know if you can see that very well, but it was hail. Um, we wish we could breathe for that. Unfortunately, probably not going to happen. So we just have to 
hope that that doesn't happen again, but we still got some good data out of that. Um, Mountain Magic had the greatest yield by far in each um, year. So if you're interested in a hybrid with really good disease resistance, um, that's a way to go. And unfortunately, it doesn't have very big fruit. It's not very slight, not like the big slicers the growers want to see. And then in terms of flavor, Green Doctor, which was something um, David Francis from Ohio State had recommended. I think it came from Carolyn Mall's breeding program was just excellent. It's a small cherry type of tomato, but it's a yellow green color. So people were kind of scared to eat it, but once they did, they loved it. It was really tasty. So step four is our selection and outreach now, um, which was initiated, as I said, in 2013. Um, we've actually, we have some um, varieties that we're starting to select out of. We want to develop some strains for Indiana. And then we already had some really nice segregating populations. But as I mentioned, John had made earlier that include the early and late blight resistance from North Carolina with some material from the Midwest, including Wisconsin 55 um, and Crimson Sprinter. Um, so we're growing each of these entries in blocks of um, six, six rows or no, six plants by five rows to encourage pollination within the block, but separating them out to discourage any pollination between the different entries. We're using a mass balanced approach for our, to develop our um, strains, but collecting individual fruit for uh, the segregating populations. And we're looking at bigger pathogen incidence, an indeterminate growth habit, non-uniform ripening, and then flavor. And then we've also, um, we did a field day workshop in 2012 on seed saving. I'm going to be doing another one um, in our Indiana Small Farm Conference in a few weeks to talk about seed saving and participatory breeding. And then also we have other field days where we just bring people in to, to look at the entries and taste them. So in 2013, I was really excited. We got late blight, um, so it could actually screen for that. I know the growers weren't so happy, but I was. Um, here on this side, we have Crimson Sprinter, which is actually you know a beautiful variety, but it is not um, resistant to early blight. So it really went down quickly. But this material on the right, again, this OSA 823, just performed really well. It got a little bit of late blight, but did not succumb like the rest of the um, entries. So we were able to get some good selection pressure there. So lastly, I just want to thank uh, the OREI program for funding the initial part of this work um, through a grant a group of us from Purdue got. Led, we got led by Kevin Gibson, as well as Purdue Ag Programs. I want to thank John Navazio for his work, um, Michael Veldstra, Jose, Maria Corrine are the economists that led the work on our survey. My lab manager, Natasha Cerruti, as well as Liz, Ian, and Kevin at Purdue. And then our farmers, Jeff, Valentino, Nathan, Kevin, and Larry, who have been helping us along the way and are interested in helping us with this selection process. Um, and I'd be happy to answer any questions at the end.